Hi, I'm Pete Camilleri from the Voodoo Room Podcast. Today's guest is Mahalia Barnes. She comes from a lineage of uh, musical uh, tradition. Her father is Jimmy Barnes, as you may know. Uh, in her own right, she's a very talented singer, a great artist. Uh, she's performed overseas. She's uh, done. Uh, she's had many accolades um, over her 20 plus years of performing. Um, so that's coming up next on the on the Voodoo Room podcast. Don't forget, no admission fees, no subscription fees, no union fees. Dollar hot dogs, dollar popcorn. Ladies and gentlemen. Mahalia Barnes. Thank you. I can do anything. Mahalia Barnes, welcome to the Voodoo Room. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure seeing your face again. It's been two years since we last saw each other, I think, something like yeah, that. Too long, too long. It has. Um, have you read your father's autobiographies? And if so, what did you think of them? I have read them. Um, you know, the first book was quite confronting to read. Um, I mean, both are pretty confronting to read, actually. But the first one I found quite difficult to read because it's, you know, from his childhood, it's this innocent little boy, you know, and his family who um, went through so much. And I think that one of the things that a lot of people didn't realise is that we weren't necessarily aware of everything else. He wasn't really even aware of it all. He hadn't spoken about it. He hadn't sort of delved deep into his his past, I suppose, in that way, because I guess because of the nature of the type of things that were going on, he probably had blocked a lot of it out. Um, and so we all got the opportunity to read it before it came out so that there were no surprises for us or whatever. But, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking to think of somebody, of anyone, someone that you don't know going through that sort of stuff as a ch- small child, let alone as, um, you know, when it's somebody that you love. Um, so I, I really... Um, enjoyed reading them though and I found you know I I loved that I could hear his voice the whole time and I know obviously I know him better than most but it's one of those things where the way that he writes it's remarkably him you Mm. know you can see that there's no ghost writers or anyone else involved it it just sounds like him speaking yeah Um, which you know I I loved it and then the second book you know was obviously challenging in different ways because that was sort of more I guess my lifetime a lot of that stuff was in in the second book Um, and I think for him you know in the first in the first book he's a victim and in the second book it's like it's his issues you know and so that was sort of confronting in a different way but I again I really enjoyed reading them and I I really think that his honesty is remarkable and his ability to sort of deal with things that are very serious and not make not make light of them but to use his sense of humor and his sort of experience to uh to get those stories across in a way that, you know, you read it and you go, wait a minute, that's, there's a lot happening that, um, you know, a lot of people don't talk about and don't address, which I think it's, uh, it's really important. So, yeah. Yeah. That's what I was going to say to you is uh, that it, it does take a lot of uh, deep diving to sort of understand a lot of those complex internal issues that you, mm-hmm. it's what the trait that you come from and uh mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and trying to unhook that trait is very, very difficult. And we're, and a lot of people hide from that, as you you know, from, yeah. you know, and uh, it takes a lot of courage to, to sort of go down to that path and really go, well, I'm going to take this on front end and uh, deal with it, you know, and how you deal with it then and what happens from that point, who knows, you know, yeah, and how it can mess, it can mess really with people's heads a lot, you know. Absolutely. I mean, I remember uh, I knew a kid, this is just something on the side thing. But I knew yeah. when I was 16, 15, 16, I knew this kid who didn't know he was adopted until he was 15. So he was doing his HSC at the time. Yeah. And as soon as his parents told him that he was adopted, he spun out like big time. And yeah. I remember one Sunday night, middle of winter in Melbourne, I hear this at like midnight on my bedroom window. I go, what are you doing? <laughs> and he goes, can I just sleep on your floor? And I'm like, Sure, yeah. jump. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean. But, but from that point on, that guy, from a guy who was really academic and really smart and studious, at the, mate, he just went off the rails, you know, and, and really fucked with his head. And I, yeah. and I can imagine, you know, the trauma. That we're talking about trauma, basically. Trauma, yeah. yeah. And that's the thing. Like trauma for everybody is different. Everyone's got their stuff, you know. Like there's, you know, you can't, re- but you can't really compare trauma because depending on 
where you're at in your life, what else is happening around, what you've experienced prior, you know, what state you're in mentally, emotionally, you know, you can be incredibly vulnerable and other times you can be incredibly resilient. But at some point when you open up that door, you have to address it and you have to deal with it, you know, and I think that we're very fortunate to live in a society where it's, well, there's a lot of help available for one and that it is actually acceptable. I mean, I think that, you know, particularly for, you know, for young men, um, it's a different world than it was 50 years ago, you know, because the reality is like you were supposed to suck it up and not not cry, not talk about it, you know, you don't need help, don't be, don't be such a wuss, you know. And these days, you know, it's, I mean, I would like to think that in, in a lot, it's a lot more in the mainstream that it's okay, it's actually important to ask for help, you know. And I think that um, for me one of the things getting to do that whole process of touring the the autobiographies that he wrote, we did the shows that we did. And um, one of the things that I thought was really important and really powerful about those shows was the fact that, you know, dad, who's a, you know, a rock star, a rock and roll, you know, wild man, tough guy, whatever else anyone likes to think of him as, as this public persona is there being incredibly vulnerable and open and honest yeah. and saying, you know, I needed help. I need help now go and get help. It's okay. Cause it's actually incredibly strong to be able to do that because it's difficult. It's hard, you know, it's confronting to be that vulnerable. Um, but hopefully, you know, for me, the biggest message that can come out of people like dad or, or anyone sharing their experiences and their stories is that you're not alone and it's okay to need help, you know? So I thought it was really powerful. Totally. Great thing. So what was it like uh, being on season one of The Voice? <laughs> it was a, that was a strange ride for me. Um, I've never auditioned for anything in my life. I've never thought about what I do other than just what I want to do, you know, as far as being creative and performing. Um, and so I think in the past I had always said I would never go on a show, never not in, not that I had any judgment of people who did go on them, but just that I wasn't necessarily interested in that sort of thing. Um, but um, when I was asked to do the first season, I mean, they were, it was the brand new show out here. We hadn't sort of seen it. And, and you know, it was sort of um, sold as being something completely different. And, you know, a lot of the other shows, they desperately wanted to pluck somebody out of oblivion, someone who'd never been, in the industry, never had any experience, and they create this superstar. Yeah. And, you know, from my understanding, the voice was coming out and wanting to not necessarily exclude those people, but also to be able to be a platform for performers and artists who maybe, you know, felt that they wanted their voice out to a wider demographic or a different demographic. Um, and there are a lot of my friends um, and amazing musicians that I, love and respect who who auditioned in the same year and you know it sort of felt like safety in numbers to be honest like it felt like well can't be bad if we all do it right you know and but then I sort of put myself into that position and then when I went to go and audition I was actually terrified um which I'd never really experienced before because I mean I get nervous for shows because I would say it's more excitement than anything else because I love it and yeah. I care but it was very different. I just suddenly felt like, oh, my gosh, I don't know how to do this. What do, what do they want? What are they going to think? What are they going to do? What, what is this process? Because I just, like I said, I hadn't been through that. And, you know, at the end of the day, yes, it's a music show, but it's it's TV, you know, and so it is very different to what <laughs> I'm used to. <laughs> There's a lot of time and a lot of other pressures and yeah. different things going on, moving parts. Um to sort of create the the rise and fall of a TV show, you know, it's a totally did, different world. Did they um, do that at some big arena or? No, so we did auditions. So the initial auditions we did, um, we had to send in ourselves singing, I think, and then we had to go and do an audition and they're like there's, you know, three people, three producers or something like that sitting at a table and you sort of go in there and, hi, I'm Mahalia and uh, this is a, and, you know, sing your song and then go out and then they contact you if you're successful. Um, so it was quite bizarre for me. Um, and then obviously then you go onto the show and you do the blind auditions and that whole thing is a, another world and that's, you know, there's all this energy in that space because of 
you know, it being a new show and the unknowns um, that I found quite, you know, quite interesting, quite challenging for me actually. But I, I wouldn't say that I didn't enjoy the process. Like I'm, I quite like to put myself out of my comfort zone. I think it's important to um, sometimes do something that you would normally not do, you know, that you say you would never do um, and just sort of see the other side of it and why and, you know, be open to what can happen. And, I mean, as I went to walk out on the stage to do my um, my first actual performance in the room, I had like a sudden, sudden moment of like, I don't know if it was realisation or panic and I was like, wait a minute, what if no one turns around for me? What if I'm the person that they want to make an example of? What if I'm not good enough? But even if I am good enough, what if they don't turn around because just to say just because you're Jimmy's daughter doesn't mean you're going to have anyone turn around, you know, maybe I'm the example. I had this like sudden like moment of panic, um, which thankfully didn't didn't happen in the end. Um, and I got to go out there and sing. And I just thought at the end of the day, I'm going to sing like me. I'm going to do what I do and hopefully people like it. And, you know, I think that it ended up to um, being quite a good experience for me um and I got a lot of exposure from that platform and you know I I didn't go very far <laughs> I got out pretty much straight away but I got to sing a couple of um songs in front of uh, you know millions of people I suppose so that can only be a good thing yeah I mean that's what it's about You're just exposing your profile yeah. and any yeah. any uh what they used to say in business was uh any any um publicity is good publicity, publicity. yeah exactly <laughs> Exactly, right? And that's just a way of looking at it, right? Yeah. And that's the thing. Like I didn't go in there expecting to be, you know, winning and signed up to a major label deal and have suddenly I'll be like selling millions of records. It wasn't like that wasn't what it was for me. It was just like, hey, why not? I might as well. I mean, I've been performing for my whole life and, you know, this is a, it's a, there's not a lot of platforms in Australia for you to get out there to a mainstream audience that's just the reality and I don't I don't make music that is particularly radio mainstream friendly or anything like that so it's not like I'm you know blasting on the across the airwaves every day for people to familiarize themselves with me and so for me it was an opportunity to prove myself as well to those who perhaps had a recognition of my name because of who I am but had never actually heard me sing Mm. so yeah I thought why not Great. So what do you think of um, reality TV uh, shows do for Australian music industry? Well, (laughs) I think it's really (laughs) difficult. Again, I think it depends what you think you're going to get out of it as an artist. Mm -hmm. Um, I get really worried about a lot of young people um, or not necessarily even just young people, just maybe inexperienced as far as the music industry is concerned, um, people going on those shows and getting caught up in this whirlwind and maybe not really understanding um, what comes along with it and then what what is required afterwards. You know, there's an expectation, like I just said, of like that you think that you're going to go on there and become this big superstar and suddenly it's all just going to work and that's not really how our industry works. You know, it takes a lot of work and there's a lot of, moving parts behind the scenes and there's a lot of factors that you can only really, I mean, a lot, and there's, there's luck and there's, you know, good people around you. There's, you know, your work ethic is really important. And I think that sometimes maybe the TV shows, while they can be a real benefit as far as getting somebody's name to the general public and getting some music out there um, initially, it's what happens after that really counts and what has happened before that really counts mm. as well if you're going to have a sustainable career long term. Um, so well, I hope as well, though, that people understand that they have to get off the couch yeah. and go and support gigs, you know, and that's the thing. I, I, I find that maybe we make it a little bit too easy by bringing it all to them yeah. sometimes to an audience and, that, you know, with those shows, what unfortunately can happen in a lot of cases is that like you're all the rage for the while the season's on and then it's gone and you never hear from them again or or the audience the majority of the audience don't follow that up I mean it's not the case for everyone there are some amazing artists who have done really incredibly off reality shows um but it's just understanding that it is entertainment and it's tv 
not that's, necessarily music. That's right. I think one of the things with experience, you know, is that it, um, you learn to read the room <laughs> and you learn to read what is required with a particular audience, you know. And, uh, you know, I'm incredibly grateful that the audiences that I play to, certainly in the last, you know, few years, um, I have quite a lot of people who are repeat customers, which is a good thing. It's always a good sign when you have people who come back, yeah. you know. Um, but even if it's, you know, people who have seen you before or people who are new, um, you want to try and have a, an audience or I, I love having an audience that are willing to come on a, a journey with me throughout the show. You know, I, I don't particularly like to be like, okay, this is what I play and this is all I do and we always do it the same. That's not sort of my style. And for some people it is what they want to do. Um, I love to, you know, have different players with me and we bounce different ideas around and, you know, some nights will be a guitar solo, it might be a keyboard solo. Sometimes I might do this song or maybe I don't do that at all, you know, and, we have a, a lot of flexibility in our shows. And so for me, I'm, I'm very fortunate that the audience that I do have, generally speaking, they don't come only to see me sing Proud Mary from The Voice or whatever it is. Some of them, you go, you know what, let's just give them what they want. That's what they want. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> but, so yeah. you, keep, you keep the uh, musicians on their toes then? I do, I do. <laughs> <laughs> they like it that way as well. I mean, I'm, again, I've had a band that... Um, you know, various members of my band, we've played together for so many years that we essentially are family. You know, they're called the soulmates and they really are that to me. They're my best friends in the world. Um, but we have various lineups that sort of cross over depending on the show and what's appropriate, everything from two of us to 14 of us if it need be. Um, but, you know, Clayton Dolly, for example, who plays keyboards with me, he and I have made music together since I was 13 years old and I'm 40 this like next year. So, you know, we've been, we've been working together for a little while. Yeah. Um, Lockie, his brother has also been playing with me since I think 99 or 2000, maybe. Um, the bass player in the band is my husband, Ben, you know, we've been, we've been together for must be 14 years or so, you know, it's like, the new guy in the band, Franco, the guitarist, I still call him the new guy, but I think he's been playing in the band for more than 12 years. Yeah. You know, so we've we've got a lot of, oh, he has definitely for more than 12 years, actually. I'm just thinking the fact that my child is 12 means that, yeah, it's longer than that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, you know, like it is like family. And so when you have people that you speak the same language, you learn each other's body language and, you know, little tells that you have musically when you have that sort of connection, that long standing. I mean, some people you have it with instantaneously as well, um, but that makes it really exciting for us. And I think that that's exciting for the audience too. Totally. Do the bat, do the guitar player or the bass player or any other musicians just throw up a song to you and say, Hey, Mihaly, let's do this now. Yeah. Quite often they do. Like, I'll be like, you know, actually <laughs> since, since COVID, um, We've done a few little shows here and there because obviously we've, while we haven't been able to travel interstate or anything like that, we've still been able to do some shows at different points, um, restricted capacities. And it's just meant that they've been very different types of shows. And I've actually really enjoyed that. And um, of late, we've been not writing any sort of set list at all. I often write a set list and then I don't follow it anyway. So I just thought, well, why bother? <laughs> so instead of writing a set list, occasionally I've got like this long list of songs that I might do, but I've also just been throwing it out to the audience or anyone in the band that if anyone wants to hear something, um, yell it out. I'm okay with heckling. Mm. Some people don't like it. I embrace heckling. I think bring it on. Give me what, what do you want, you know, and I'll see. And at the moment our rule that we've been a, uh, following for the last little while is as long as one person on the stage knows the song we can try we can try yeah yeah and just sometimes that's okay most of the time it's all right every now and then you know it leaves a, a little fun. to be desired but you know it's all part of the journey that's right <laughs> so um what do you what did your dad teach you that every up-and-coming musician could benefit from knowing you know what he has taught me so much i mean Obviously, you know, I've grown up around these incredible musicians and, you know, teams of people and I've seen all the mistakes and I've seen all of the wins and all the losses, you know. Um, but I think just watching Dad, the thing that inspires me the most and has taught me the most and I think is important for us to realise is that, you know, he's he does every single show, every single song like it's the last. You know, he does he leaves nothing behind. Um 
and he loves it. You know, he is, he's what, in his mid-60s, he's been playing, touring since he was a teenager and he's had all these successes and big hits and, you know, could easily sit back, I suppose, and just take it easy. But he's still trying to learn. You know, he's genuinely excited by new music and he loves working with different people and someone that pushes him or excites him and then he tries to push himself out of his comfort zone. And, you know, that's the thing. Like, I think, you know, it's what you see is these people who have this enduring, lasting career and may, and still have an impact not just for their hits 50 years ago or 40 years ago or whatever, are the people who still love it, you know, because if you don't, like this is not the industry to be in if you don't love it. That's there, right. are, There's always going to be days that are hard or shows that you don't enjoy or you don't feel like singing that this day or whatever it is. But at the end of the day, we, um, we are incredibly fortunate to have a job that you can really enjoy and love. Um, but it also takes a lot of hard work. So if you don't love it enough, you're never going to be able to make it because it's, it's too hard. Yeah, exactly. What what is great, I think, about our industry is that you know we've got a, there's a lot of really amazing crossovers from different genres and different types of artists, and I think that that's another thing that you've got to be open to. Like I I think that you know seeing that generation of of artists, it's like they're fiercely competitive in that they want to be successful, but they <laughs> but they love you know it's not there's not for the most part, there's not ego. It's just joy getting to do it. And it's like comp- competition in a sense of, you know, spurring each other on and making each other better, mm. you know, and that's something that I really love. And that that sort of collaborative spirit is something that for me is really has resonated um, and is really important to me. And, you know, if you look through whatever I've done, I'm working with everyone that I can. I yeah. love working with other singers. I love working with other musicians and getting to have you know, a different perspective that then pushes me in a different direction. Again, it's that thing of liking to push myself out of my comfort zone. I like to be challenged. Like I'm not threatened singing with anyone, not because I think I'm so great that no one can beat me. It's because I want someone to kick my ass yeah. because then that makes me step up and work harder. You know, that's the, that's the fun part. That's it. And my last question is uh, would you perform for children again? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's 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 a challenging thing performing for children. I'll be honest. You know, they're the, probably the toughest crowd <laughs> that you could ever have. Um, obviously, like I performed mostly for children when I was also a child, so you know, maybe they were more welcoming of me then. Um, but recently, I, I played a show. It was a, a local gig where I live. Um, they had this sort of like festival sort of thing on for the community, and. Um, Let's just say I generally play to a slightly older demographic. Um, you know, not that I only play to old people, but I do generally have an older demographic because of the genre, um, the style of music that I play. Um, and I was one of the headline acts um, at this local festival. And I got there and I, I looked out at the audience and I thought, they're not going to know any of these songs. Like my big hits that I play, like the big favourites that are crowd pleasers no matter what. I was like, oh, yeah, we've got all these ones up our sleeve. And I was like, none of these children know these songs because they were literally the front row were about like eight to 12 years old. <laughs> I was like, what am I going to play? They're going to hate us. <laughs> but actually it was really sweet. And amazingly, um, I, um, I, I asked if any of them, you know, I thought, oh, what, what do they want to hear? And this one little girl who was probably about maybe eight or nine years old yelled out, play I Am Woman. I was like, I can do that for you. <laughs> and it was really like... It was actually really wonderful to see that there's like this new young generation of, of kids who are open to all sorts of music, you know, not just wanting to hear, you know, your mainstream top 40 pop music, you know. There was a lot of that going on through the sound system throughout the day, but they were dancing and they were into it. So I was like, oh, you know, hey, the kids aren't so bad. <laughs> um, did they have to wear masks, anything like that? Or? Not at that point. That was sort of like in between sort of lockdown periods and stuff like that. So that was okay. And it was an outdoor festival. Um, but, yeah, it's been it's interesting playing these gigs where people are all masked up and stuff. But I also have to remind myself I'm not allowed to ask them to sing along. Stop telling them to sing along. <laughs> <laughs> I strongly encourage audience participation. It's like not yeah. allowed at the moment. That's, well, that's all I've got for you today, Mahalia. Yeah. No worries. Uh, thank you very much for your time. 
Thank you. Thanks for having me. I hope to see you back in Melbourne at some stage. Yeah, I'm coming soon, I think. I think we're coming back in February, it looks like. I'm thinking I might actually bring the strip back show in for the next one that I do because I've been really loving doing it and it just takes it on a completely different journey. So it's probably, you know, a good one to try. So, And what's the strip back show? What's that? It's been usually myself and the guitarist, basically no drums, but sort of two guitars and piano. Oh, yeah, nice. Yeah, it's really cool. We sort of do all great, sorts of stuff. Great, great piano. Yep. So who play, are, you play, are you playing the piano? Or? No, Clayton or Lucky. Or, it depends on the, yeah. yeah. Oh, I've been using a, different, different versions. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, take care and all have right. a safe uh, Christmas if I don't see you. Well. Yeah, you too. Okay, thanks, Mahal. All right. See you, Pete. Bye, then. Bye. Voodoo strikes. It'll tear apart your head when voodoo strikes. You wish that you was dead when voodoo strikes.